Welcome back to the American College Surgeons Bulletin Brief from the Frontline Surgeons Voices. With me today is the voice of an incredible surgeon, someone who I've known for many years, who is a respected trauma surgeon, but as you're also about to hear, an amazing human being with huge altruistic influences in his life due to a variety of some unfortunate circumstances. Uh, Dr. Asensio is currently the professor and vice chair of surgery, chief of the division of surgery and critical care, uh, and director of the trauma center and trauma program in the department of surgery at Creighton University School of Medicine. He's also been recognized for his many talents by professorships at a myriad of medical schools uh, throughout the country. Uh, he has his fellowship from the Royal College of Surgeons of England. He's on faculty as an adjunct professor of surgery at the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences, but I don't want to preempt any more of Dr. Asensio's time. I could take the entire interview recounting and regaling you with his many accolades and very deserved honors, but, but I'd like to welcome Dr. Asensio to our program today. Hey, Dr. Wexner, it's a privilege to be with good friends and particularly uh, a colleague that uh, has a world-class reputation I've admired for many, many years. Thank you for your friendship, and for all that you've done for surgeons and American College of Surgeons, and particularly all over the world. I am currently a professor of surgery at Creighton University at uh, Uniform Services University Health Sciences, Walter Reed Bethesda, and I've also am appointed as an adjunct professor at Emory University, Morehouse School of Medicine, Mercer University, the Medical College of Georgia at Augusta uh, University. A lot of people obviously sort of would like to know that uh, I do have some academic achievements. I'll summarize them very briefly. Uh, it's about 593 publications, 24 textbooks, a Google H index of 84. Um, I've been uh, very privileged to uh, belong to over 90 surgical societies, including many honorary uh, surgical uh, uh, societies. And I'm currently finishing along with my colleague, Wayne Meredith, and of course, Don Trunke Emeritus, the seventh edition of uh, current uh, therapy of trauma. I've been funded by the NIH and DOD over $50 million. And I've had uh, over 200 international visiting professorships and uh, almost as many nationally. But I think the most important thing that I'm proud of is that I am America. I am sort of that story that uh, many people sometimes forget. That is many have not been born in this country and I wasn't. I was born in Havana, Cuba. My grandparents are from Spain and my entire family has always uh, been fighting for the freedom of that country. I, uh, when I was a, a kid, um, my oldest brother and I got uh, taken away uh, by the communist system to be trained as future communists. So I have my first military training at the age of 10. Now, I don't want people to forget that I came from a country where Castro uh, was the greatest admirer of Hitler and Franco. As a matter of fact, the, the first book he requested while he was in this prison was Mein Kampf. And that is sort of an amazing thing. Um, I steadfastly, and so did my oldest brother, repudiated the Marxist, uh, if you would, uh, theory. And that landed me uh, for a six month stint on a prison, which prisons in a totalitarian country are considerably uh, different than what they are in the United States. My oldest brother did eight years. I was 13 going on 14. So they kept me with uh, young men. Luckily, I was able to be released through the courtesy of one of my uncles and came to this country. I didn't even know if I was ever gonna uh, see my parents again. But throughout it all, I grew up in Chicago. Uh, my life was spared and I get a little emotionally by Mrs. Evelyn Handler, my Jewish mama, who found some riffraff kid out of nowhere uh, in a high school where he didn't belong because I had already had up to two years of college two years of Chinese and two years of, um, of Russian. And she said, you don't belong here. And she had a, 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 an interesting accent. She was the descendant of uh, 
Russian immigrants. And this woman finished the University of Chicago at the age of 16. That's how brilliant she was. And she dedicated her life to teaching kids in the inner city in my high school, Lakeview High School, just the oldest high school, a very violent high school. But she uh, got me to go to AP courses and even some college courses. Of course, I came back and and, and did my five uh, different sports, which got me an opportunity uh, to get to the University of Illinois uh, at Urbana, where I played baseball, being Cuban American. Obviously, that's sort of in, in born into you and wrestle. And um, I uh, finished uh, college a uh, year ahead, and I did not know what to do with my life. My parents did not speak English, they were uh, laborers. And eventually, so I hung out for one extra year, even after I blew up my knees, my coaches let me keep my athletic. And of course I had academic scholarships. And eventually I didn't have a lot of money to apply to medical school. So I only applied to five medical schools here in, in Chicago. I ended up going to Rush where I finished early and then on to Northwestern uh, for surgery and research and then the University of Texas Southwestern at Parkland Memorial Hospital, where I did multiple uh, fellowships. From then on, it's been an academic uh, career. Well, it's been a very, very impressive uh, academic career, as you mentioned earlier on, with your 593 publications and, and your uh, H index uh, and uh, all of your 200 visiting professorships and so on. It's, it's incredibly impressive. And as is often the case with people who are so productive and so successful, there's a passion. And that passion is usually igniting a spark that came from somewhere. And perhaps yours in part came from your experience in, 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 in prison in, in Cuba. But I understand from a, uh, an article which you kindly sent me in advance of this interview that you also had a tragedy with your brother in, in Chicago, which uh, may have also helped form uh, or, or further that passion in you for wanting to excel at, at trauma care. I don't know if you'd be willing to share that story with us or, or some of the others that were in the, the beautiful testimonial article. Uh, absolutely. My kid brother, uh, Alfredo, uh, grew up in the inner city like me, and uh, I knew the best way out for him was to go into the army. My family has a long, long-standing uh, history of serving uh, the United States uh, military it goes way back to my uh, grandfather and my father and uncles. And uh, so when he came out of the military, he came, he got married, had a baby girl, my niece, and he had a job working in this company that made very special gears. Uh, he, they were working, uh, working on making gears for the space shuttle. And at that time, uh, his boss lent him his car. It was carjacked and he was shot five times in the head. And so that happened very early in my career. I thought that was a call to arms. Um, I always uh, was raised with the concept that you have to do good for people to him who much has been given from him much expected. And for Mrs. Handler, I knew that I had to do a good deed every day. She would call that a mitzvah. And uh, she definitely... Uh, we honor her, by the way, as the American College of Surgeons had a major presentation, and she was honored with a bouquet of over 200 red and white roses for the many contributions that she had to the inner city uh, kids. So for me, this was a call to arms, and so every major inner city that I've been, I partner with their police department, with the sheriff's department, with the uh, uh, school system, with many other uh, agencies even governmental agencies, both at the city and state level, so that we would be able to go and talk to uh, kids at risk and in the inner city high schools. Also went to a lot of different prisons, not just juvenile hall. That approach towards the peaceful resolution of this conflict um, was something that has been a major theme in, in my life. Uh, I have uh, attended to a myriad of war wounded in many different countries. I'll just say in the uh, United States Distinguished uh, Professors Program uh, at the behest of the um, United States military uh, at Landstuhl, uh, Germany and other places. Seen a lot of violence in Colombia and Mexico 
Uh, and so for me, this was just the, the possible, the best way to try to resolve things and to prevent uh, kids because they don't get to see, you know, what actually does happen. So we've probably lectured to over 19,000 uh, students uh, at risk, as well as many uh, different uh, uh, individuals that are powerful leaders in the community. This has resulted in over 80 documentaries, including uh, 60 Minutes uh, with Dan, rather. He titled it The Crusader. Interesting, I still have kept in contact with him. Uh, and also uh, Discovery and Discovery Health. Um, and that uh, sort of a passion to me remains the same. Of course, teaching has always been a passion. I've had the, the uh, privilege of having 127 international visiting scholars. I worked for quite a long time in the International Relations Committee, bringing in uh, many of the scholars. And we try to balance that, uh, bringing people from places that otherwise would have, we would have never, they never would have had the chance, uh, including people from Syria, Georgia, many countries in Africa the Asian uh, and Indian subcontinents, and most importantly, um, two international visiting scholars from, uh, from Cuba that, uh, that also were able to, to come. Oh, you, you mentioned um, the uh, crusader that uh, Dan Rather had, had given you that uh, appellation and congratulations on both your discovery channel work and on uh, being featured by, by Dan Rather, uh, really amazing testimonials to the work you've done. Um, but um, when one thinks of Crusaders, there's also an association with uh, certain parts of the world, including uh, Jerusalem and, and, and Malta. Um, and indeed, um, I, I know that's been another passion of yours, um, interrelated being uh, a, a knight. Um, I, I don't want to get the terminology wrong, uh, but uh, it, I know that the order has been around for more or less a millennium um, and uh, has had a lot of work done uh, through the uh, St. John in Jerusalem uh, Center. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about what your role is. Uh, I am uh, a Knight of Magistral Grace uh, and hopefully soon to be a Knight of Obedience to the Sovereign Military Hospitaller Order of St. John's of Jerusalem. Rhodes in Malta is called the Order of Malta. Now this order, like many misguided uh, events that occurred throughout the time, started, uh, you know, in the, in the, uh, in, in, in Jerusalem, in the, in Al Dreamer, as it was called. And uh, it, they, they were really to provide, if you would, uh, protection for the pilgrims. Contrary to the more popular Templars, we were actually the doctors. It's interesting to me enough that we actually worked with, uh, in, those, uh, uh, in those times, with Arab and Jewish doctors because they were considerably more advanced than European doctors. The order, of course, has evolved. It is a pure philanthropic organization. It does a lot of work in all over the world, uh, anytime there has been a war, we've got a hospital there. And to me, reflecting on this great honor, as we are taught, is we are, you know, Jerusalem is the test, God's test to all the three major monotheistic religions. And the test says, why can we not get along and love each other? Uh, obviously, that's my altruistic side, idealistic side, uh, and that is what I have also strived to teach all of my over 120 trauma surgery fellows and countless residents and medical students and all these international visiting scholars. So when they return home, they follow that humanistic concept, and that to me is very, very important. Because after all, in the operating room, we deal with terrible diseases, and all blood is red. If it is arterial, it's a little brighter. If it's venous, it's a little darker. But that human being has been assigned to us so that we can take care of them and give them a better shot at life. And I, I cannot think of any greater, uh, any greater responsibility that is given to all of us, where the white coat who swore the 
oath of Hippocrates, and in my case also the oath of Maimonides, uh, who actually was a Spanish uh, a Spaniard. Uh, and a lot of people uh, forget that, that Spain at one time or another had great peaceful coexistence, particularly in the city of Toledo, where many, many things have flourished. And if that example can be taken and taught, then I think the world would be, I think, a lot, a lot uh, better. Uh, we do a lot of work with immigrants in, uh, in the order of Malta. We have a lot of projects in Africa, all over Asia, Latin America, and it's all done regardless of who it is that we're working with. Case in point, one of the last operating hospitals in Syria, in Aleppo, was one of the order uh, of our order. And also, we have had a hospital in Jerusalem that has been there since the year 1066 that attends to it's, 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 a, it's an obstetric gynecology, perinatology, neonatology hospital that attends to women regardless of the race or religion. I think uh, we are leaders in the field of surgery. You are an internationally renowned surgeon, and by the grace of God, I've been given that privilege too. But we're also leaders in our community, and this is part of, of, of our, if you would, uh, when we are surgeons. Well, you exemplify it. You clearly are an inspiration to, to young surgeons from this country, to surgeons of all ages, of all countries, with what you've done, uh, how you've intermixed your, your work uh, with the Knights, as well as with the Order of St. John, and training and, and giving selflessly at so many universities and, and so many other places, not to mention the 19,000 children who, who benefited from your wisdom. And I urge everyone to read the article uh, that we'll link because it, it really is quite impressive reading about exactly what you show those children, which I'm sure creates in them a lasting image and might be the best possible negative reinforcement. In other words, to avoid Violence. I'm, I'm sure that's the point. It, it's been a pleasure having you today. Um, I'm sure you've managed to shift some minds of undecided medical students and, and residents towards trauma. Um, and I thank you for that. I'd like to give you the opportunity for any uh, last words before we conclude. I am uh, Hispanic. I uh, obviously grew up extremely poor in the city of Chicago. I was a very good cab driver. I think you, you need to know that. So. Uh, maybe when I retire, I can go and, and drive a cab and kind of look around the city. Um, it's that, that humility, it, to me, is, is extremely uh, important. Um, I want that now that we are in this sort of a new world where we are being a little more inclusive, my message is that sometime, you know, I hope, in the future, in my lifetime, then when people begin to address individuals in this country, we will no longer call them by uh, African Americans, uh, Hispanic Americans, uh, Muslim Americans, Jewish Americans, Asian Americans, Native Americans, LGTB, whatever. I think this country is at a critical junction and it must recognize that we are all Americans. I, I may never get to see that. But certainly that is something that I'm always going to try to work. And at the same and for. And at the same time, the message is there is no substitute for excellence. And there is an old, old uh, biblical term, I think it's in the in the old testament that uh, that says, uh, I, I heard the word of the Lord, and he said, Who should I send? And who will go for me? And I raised my hand. I said, here I am, Lord, send me. Because I firmly believe in this. I paid a huge price. And I shared that uh, biblical verse because it was one of the favorite verses of David Richardson, very dear friend of mine, may he rest in peace, former president of, of the college. And uh, to me, that is extremely important. We are all called here. I 
hope I don't sound very um, jingoistic, but you know, doctor's pretty special and surgeons are very, very special. I mean, we get to really sculpt, you know, God's creation. That's kind of an amazing thing. Not very many people can do that. And we do it with the great desire of contributing and, and putting families back together, healing people, things like that. I'm still in love and mesmerized by, by our profession. And I hope that everybody is. And I encourage everyone to continue to, to reach for that brass ring, to, to see how privileged we are, and also to, to give and give back as much as you possibly can. Well, thank you very much. I greatly appreciate your time, your insights, your, your passion is, is palpable, your, your, your commitment is uh, second to none, and, and your talents are already quite legion. So thank you for, for sharing uh, your inspirational vision with us, what makes you tick, and what I think is going to bring a lot of other people along ticking with you. Appreciate it. Stay well. Look forward to seeing you in person somewhere in the hopefully not too distant future. Thank you very much for the privilege and honor, uh, Dr. Wexner. It's always great when you can uh, sort of uh, start your day talking to a person you admire and a very, very good friend. It's quite, quite mutual, I can assure you. Bye-bye.